The common lodging houses of Spitalfields and Whitechapel are integral to the Jack the Ripper story. There were around 146 of them in the district in 1888, and every night hundreds of men and women paid fourpence for a single bed or eightpence for a double bed to find some semblance of shelter behind their decaying walls. Almost all the victims of Jack the Ripper, the exception was Mary Kelly, were residing at various common lodging houses in Spitalfields at the times of their murders, and all of them had led transient existences flitting between these establishments in the months or even years leading up to their deaths. The police appear to have believed at several stages of their investigations into each of the murders that the perpetrator may have fled to the relative safety from detection that the anonymity afforded by the common lodging houses provided, and we know that in the wake of several of the atrocities, one of the first things that the police did was make extensive inquiries at these places. Ultimately, these inquiries proved futile, as the police never did trace the perpetrator, but that's not to say that he wasn't hiding in plain sight amongst the transient populace that lived within them for varying periods of time, sometimes for just a single night, sometimes for several months, and sometimes for several years. As a consequence of this, anyone researching the history of the Whitechapel murders, or, for that matter, studying the social conditions in the East End of London in 1888, inevitably ends up trawling through a vast amount of information about the common lodging houses that is contained in the newspapers of the era, as well as in the official records of the period. And in so doing, you often come across little nuggets of information that offer a tantalising glimpse of the everyday lives of the men, women, and children to whom these establishments were home. One such story that, depending on how you view it, will either intrigue, raise a smile, or cause you to reach for the sick bag, was reported in Reynolds's weekly newspaper on the 29th of December, 1889. Just to briefly explain the setup as far as the coroner's courts went in the area where the murders occurred, until 1888 much of the East End had come under the coronial district of East Middlesex. But in 1888, the district had been subdivided into southeastern Middlesex, which incorporated the slum districts of Whitechapel and Bethnal Green, and which was presided over by Coroner Wynne Edwin Baxter, and northeast Middlesex, which was presided over by Coroner Dr. Roderick MacDonald. Baxter had presided over the inquests into the deaths of Mary Nichols, Annie Chapman, and Elizabeth Stride whereas MacDonald had conducted the inquest into the death of Mary Kelly. The lack of a dedicated mortuary for Spitalfields was a bone of contention with both coroners, as it meant that bodies either had to be sent to the mortuaries of neighbouring parishes to await an inquest when one was deemed necessary, or they had to be left in situ at the location at which they had died, an issue that was highlighted by the Reynolds's weekly newspaper article. At the meeting of the White Chapel Board of Works, Mr. Kearsey called attention to the fact that on the 14th of December a man died in a common lodging house in Spitalfields. The body was laid on a corner of the kitchen table. On Saturday and Sunday nights, 350 people slept in the lodging house. Two great fires were kept going in the kitchen and food was cooked and eaten in the same room. The body lay on a portion of the kitchen table during the whole of that time, with simply a few rags placed around it. For three days and nights, the body lay in the room and could be seen by everybody there. The Reverend J. H. Scott, rector of Spitalfields, said that he understood there was no mortuary in Spitalfields to which it could be removed. He trusted, however, that no reflection would be cast upon the people in charge of the lodging house. Mr. Kiersey said that he did not wish to cast any reflection upon the lodging house. The local authorities were responsible. The relieving officer was written to, but he wrote back to the effect that he had no power, whilst the coroner's office said that the body must lie there till the inquest was held. There was some difficulty between coroners MacDonald and Baxter. The bodies in Coroner Baxter's district were removed to the mortuary, but in Coroner MacDonald's district the bodies were compelled to lie until the inquest was held. He hoped that the same mortuary accommodation would eventually be found in the two districts. Dr Lone, the medical officer for the district, said that up to the present time, by the courtesy of the guardians, they had generally been able to get bodies removed to the guardians' mortuary, 
but unfortunately, that very day, the Guardian's tenancy of the mortuary had been terminated, so that, although in the South District he had received particulars of a death which occurred that morning, there was absolutely no mortuary to which to remove the body. Mr Tarling, of the London County Council, said that he would like to know how it was that the body was left all the time without being placed in a shell. In the whole course of his life he had not heard of a more monstrous thing. Dr J Hall said that Coroner MacDonald would not allow any of his clients to be removed into Whitechapel. He should rather suggest that the Vicar of Spitalfields might get over the scandal by allowing the vault of Spitalfields Church to be used as a mortuary. Spitalfields at present had no mortuary whatever, and, as the law stood, it would not allow a body to be removed from Spitalfields to Whitechapel. The Reverend J. H. Scott said that he was about to make the same suggestion himself, as he did not know of a more suitable place. They could authorise the sanitary officer to place bodies there. The whole matter was ultimately referred to a mortuary committee to deal with. So, there you see one of the problems that confronted the authorities in Spitalfields when it came to dealing with those who died and required removal. There was no mortuary to take them to. However, despite the article mentioning the fact that neighbouring Whitechapel had a mortuary, in truth that mortuary was little more than a shed and a constant gripe made by the medical men who were expected to perform post-mortems on the bodies of the various victims concerned the lack of adequate facilities in which to conduct their work. Sadly, the article makes no mention of the reaction of the residents of the lodging house to the fact that they were expected to go about their business, eating, drinking and chatting for several days with a dead body lying on a table. One thing we do know about the lodging houses is that the kitchen was the centre of everyday life and the residents spent a great deal of time there. Perhaps they were too busy fighting their daily battles for survival to care that much. After all, if the numerous press reports are to be believed, the scenes that they saw in the streets around them were gruesome enough. So the fact that they were expected to go about their lives, preparing their food and eating it, with the decomposing body of a dead resident lying on the table alongside them, was probably no worse than many of the horrible things that they witnessed day in and day out in the Victorian East End. <laughs>